Hi, Giles. So hey, hey. Um, uh, we, uh, for those of you who are, who are watching this, uh, not for Giles, Giles and I have been um, talking a little bit, and I noticed that every time you and I get on the phone, we hurl insults at each other for a couple of minutes, and then we get to the professional presentational portion of the programming. So that's where we are now. We've gotten the um, what you referred to earlier as the unpleasantries out of the way, and mm -hmm. now we want to talk about um, what we're going to be doing in Ukraine. We're pre-recording this video. So um, Giles is on his way uh, in a couple of days to Ukraine, where we're not sure what our Zoom uh, capabilities are going to be. So we're going to pre-record this video. And then once Giles gets uh, to Ukraine, uh, we're going we're gonna to get an update from him that he can record and upload at his leisure. Because you're going to be doing mostly leisure activities there, is my understanding. Yeah, you know, I'm always taking it easy whenever I can. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, take it away. Explain to us what this uh, big fundraising initiative that we are undertaking with Gish um, is this year. You know what? I'm going to actually take a step back first. Um, and I just wanted to say something to everybody in the Gish community. And that is that you know, 20 years ago, I made the choice to give up my life as a fashion photographer and what I was up to to try and make a difference with my storytelling. You know, I always say I'm not a photojournalist. I was an angry man with a camera. I saw injustice in the world and I wanted to create change with those stories. As many of uh, the Gish community know, I paid quite a high price for that when I got injured in Afghanistan, um, losing both my legs, and my arm. And, and, you know, that was 10 years ago, I managed to get back to work and have continued doing these stories. And I have to say, you know, somebody asked me the other day, why do you keep doing this work? And actually I referenced the Gish fundraiser that we do each year. This for me is my Christmas. This for me is the most exciting and meaningful point in the year for me because all the hard work I do going out there, you know, in dangerous places, it's hard work for me with my injuries, continuing to work. And every day when I'm struggling with it, I just remember what we're able to achieve every year with this fundraiser. And I just wanted to thank everyone. I mean, I'm almost crying because to me, it is actually, it is something hugely important to me. Um, Giles, I, I, um, I am so grateful to you for folding us into your work. And I'm also so grateful that, you know, Philip happened to see you give a lecture mm -hmm. one day and that our, our worlds collided because it, the, 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 the partnerships that we've been able to undertake over the last several years have also breathed new life and meaning into Gish for me, into all of the work that this whole team puts into this. It's what makes it all worth it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an incredible thing to look back on, you know, looking back on the, the things that, I mean, it's almost unbelievable. And, you know, we, it's almost unbelievable. It really no, is. And you know what? It's, and, and it's, it's, so, it's so fucking inspiring to be a part of. So um, I second what you're saying. Yeah, no, as I say, it, it for me is it's it's hard. You know, the work I've I've sacrificed a lot. And this gives me the hope every time that we can make a real difference. So when I meet people during the year and I hear these hard stories, I know at the end of that that period, I'm gonna be able to work with you guys and actually create some real change. And in fact, just this morning, I got this great photograph which I'll send to you and you can share with everyone of everybody who remember Olive, the amazing woman in Rwanda that we've been yeah. helping and setting up the farms, and her son. If you remember in the story, she had to abandon her baby, and then was reunited with him. It's an incredible story. But well, he graduated from university yesterday. And mm -hmm. I have a picture of them together at university. And she said it wouldn't have been possible without the farms, without the financing that enabled him to graduate. And there's a story of triumph over adversity, if ever you want to hear one. So, and that's thanks to everybody. Wow, that's amazing. Send that video. That's really cool. I will do. I will yeah. do. Um, and so, okay, so what, yeah, I mean, moving on to yeah. Ukraine, like, uh, I, I think it might be relevant to just start with what we've all what, what we have already done in, in partnership with you and Legacy of War in Ukraine, and, uh, and then what we are going to do. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, just briefly, I've been working in Ukraine since 2014, um, documenting the, the fighting in Donbass. And so I built up a lot of good relationships with people in the country. And one of the things that often happens when a war happens is marginalized communities, communities that are already struggling, they become even more pushed away um, 
in that, in that crisis situation. So civil society is very important in Ukraine. It's what's happening from the transition from it being under Soviet rule to the country it is now. And so I wanted to work with those organizations. So I'm partnering um, through Legacy of War with people that are working with children with very complex disabilities, adults with disabilities, um, the LGBTQ plus community, and also women's rights. And so those are the organizations I wanted to partner with that I had a history of working with. And when the war started, I reached out to them and said, you know, Legacy of War is there to help you in whatever way you want. What is it that you need from us? And honestly, I didn't think we'd be that involved. You know, there's lots of big NGOs there. But very quickly, I realized that there was a gap that these uh, people that have been fighting for human rights, that were very strong activists in the country already, were kind of being ignored by the major NGOs. And so, you know, thanks to the initial fundraiser that we did together, we've been supplying wheelchairs and ambulance that's now there, um, helping people with disabilities out of particularly dangerous areas. Um, we've supplied hundreds of wheelchairs to people and exactly the wheelchairs they need. So we're able to get the exact chair, get it out to them within a week. I mean, it's really amazing the network that we, we built up there and what we're able to achieve. That was really is important. To be able to build that infrastructure in the in the situa situation that's unfolding in Ukraine. I mean, it's a situation where actually yeah. the, the 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 militaries of the most mm -hmm. powerful countries in the world are having a very challenging time yeah. with logistics. So the fact that you're able to to find this this guerrilla network of people who well, are you know what's to... really important, and actually, you know, this is slightly different to any other fundraiser we've done because it's working directly through my foundation, the Legacy War Foundation, with these communities. They remind me of the Gish community. They're kind of people that just say, okay, here's the problem, what's the solution? We'll make it happen. We'll find a way, whatever it is. And it is incredible when you see civil society in Ukraine that, you know, some of the stories, you know, one of the stories of somebody we've helped already is an amazing woman called Elena. Um, she is... I, I, she's a powerhouse. I mean, she actually won Mother of the Year at a competition in Atlanta in the US, uh, representing Ukraine. She has five children. <laughs> I didn't know that that was an award you could get. You know what? Nor did I, but she won it. And, and she won it for Ukraine. This was several years ago. And she has her oldest child um, uh, has autism or is autistic um, and also has some other complex needs. She has two twins who are eight years old who have cerebral palsy. Um, and she has an adopted child as well, as well as another daughter. I mean, she has this incredible family. She had her own NGO um, in uh, uh, Ukraine. She was, you know, living, as she said, her perfect life. You know, she was really happy in, in the life that she had built with her husband. The area where she lived was very quickly occupied by the Russians. Um, very quickly, she realized that they were going to have to get out. The pharmacies were starting to shut when they went out. Uh, to get things for the children. The Russians were stopping them at checkpoints. And at two points, the Russians actually came into the house to try and find alcohol. At one point, threatened the, the two children in the wheelchairs. They shot at the dog. I mean, it was really terrifying. So in a very modern twist, she put a, a message out on Facebook. Um, that message was shared hundreds of times and got to the Ukrainian military. And so they launched a rescue mission. And it really was like something out of a movie. She was waiting by the river bank, the kids with her in the wheelchairs. This boat comes through the ice. It was February, so it was like frozen river. She said the guys had all balaclavas on, you know, came off the boat. Her youngest child, Misha, was terrified. And the captain stepped forward and just said, Misha, be strong. We're here to rescue you. Pick uh, them up. I wish someone would say that to me. Well, yeah. <laughs> Well, maybe, yeah, I'll find the captain and maybe he can come and rescue you as well. Um, got them on the back of the boat. They were under fire from the Russians. It took an hour to get down river where it was safe. And this is the bit I love the most is when they arrived in this small town, the whole town had come out to greet them. The mayor was there, all these individuals were out there, and they took the kids, got them in cars, um, drove them to Odessa and from Odessa to Lviv. And again, all the way through it, what you see is this Ukrainian civil society. Um, when they got to Lviv, they unfortunately had to leave all their specialist equipment behind, uh, the two wheelchairs that the twins were using, hoists to get them in the shower, etc. And thanks to the Gish community, that's what we were able to supply them with. So again, we got them the exact chairs that they had before, all the equipment. Um, and, you know, for Elena, it's a very hard time. I mean, we have to be very careful not to over romanticize resilience. We you know we've talked about resilience in the past. Right, yeah. And she, yeah, and she sent me a message a couple of days ago on Facebook, and she actually said, 
I'm embarrassed to tell people that I'm exhausted and I'm broken because she has to be the strong mother. She has to be the one who holds it together. And I was very glad that she felt she could at least reach out to me and we could talk. And again, find ways to support in the right way to help her get through this incredibly challenging time. So that's what we want to carry on doing. We want to carry on supplying uh, specialist equipment to people with disabilities across the country, not just children. We're also working with adults. We're an amazing woman called um, Yelena, who is the world karate wheelchair champion. I mean, she really is quite literally the most kick-ass woman I've met. She led a convoy out of Butcher. She's uh, just incredible powerhouse. And it's really important, again, for me, as somebody with a disability, that we don't always in conflicts represent people as victims when they have a disability. You know, there are people, activists, incredibly strong um, civil rights people, human rights campaigners out in Ukraine doing stuff. And we can't always portray people who come from marginalized communities as victims. So we're working with them. And then finally, the other group that we're working with is called Insight, um, which is an amazing organization that supports people from the LGBT community. Um, and that is in a various, um, different crises, things you wouldn't necessarily think about. So for example, there's an amazing uh, young trans woman who I had the pleasure of meeting her in, in Kiev. She's 18. She has, because of her birth, a biological male passport, mm -hmm. which means that she technically could be called up to go and fight in a male unit. She wants to be involved in the war effort, but she's like, but she's a woman. And so she has to find a way around that. So it's supporting people like that. Another story is a couple, um, a same-sex couple who had adopted uh, a young boy. Um, these two women were terrified because if the Russians had occupied the area where they were and they had to escape, stop that happening, the Russians under their what they call propaganda rule would have been able to take the child away because it's supposed to be, you know, illegal for, for same-sex couples. For those, for those who don't know, Putin's Russia is incredibly yeah. intolerant of uh lgbtqia anything uh, yep. not just intolerant but it's it's a it's a scary, oh, brutal. scary brutal punitive regime to live under if you fall um under that category yep. so 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 uh territories that have already been occupied by the russians mm -hmm. are now under that additional threat of yep. you know of, of of people's civil liberties and there's the looming threat for the rest of Ukraine that if Russia encroaches further, that those people will be victimized beyond. Exactly. And it's important to remember, you know, there was a lot of stories about people from marginalized communities wanting to uh, get out of Ukraine, and that's understandable. But it's also important to remember there's a lot of uh, people from those marginalized communities who are Ukrainian, who want to stay there and be involved in the, in the war effort to defend their country. But they need special support to be able to live safely in that environment. And so we're going to be with Gish um, working towards setting up two shelters where we can support in one women. Yeah, so, so, one. so, so Giles, maybe we yeah. should now switch gears and to, to so I, I just want to be clear that this is going to be a Gish fundraiser, but we're doing it in concert with Random Acts. So the, the money mm -hmm. will be going through Random Acts. Yep. And then on to Legacy of War and yep. the network that you have developed in um, in Ukraine. Um, yep. So all of the money is going to these to support these people in Ukraine, except for ten percent, which is going to uh, operating costs at Random Acts, um, which is something that we have to do um, for a number of reasons. A, Random Acts needs the support, but B, um, we're not licensed to be just a pure pass through organization. So I I just want to. Um, be transparent about that. 10% of these funds are going to random acts, which is all volunteer, and all of that money will be put to extremely good use. And then the remainder will be going on to directly support, I believe, the administrative costs that we're talking about in this endeavor are yeah. virtually nil. Right? No, absolutely. And, and that's the thing is that that's why, you know, as an organization, what we've always tried to do is cut out the middleman. You know, I mean, a great example is in the UK, you know, you have big fundraising organizations, then they pass on to another charity, then that charity right. finds a local partner, then they find a volunteer in Ukraine. It goes right. through about eight people who, you know, we, we avoid all that and we go straight to the source. That's why I'm 
you know, heading back to Ukraine as we speak, you know, I, I'm on my way back there so that I will sit with these partners and we make sure that it actually has the impact it needs to have. Okay, so will you tell us what the two now, uh, after that preamble, let's yes. uh, explain the two projects that we are going to raise money for in the Vive and hopefully get funded this week. Yeah. In so just to explain to people as well, Lviv is a border town. Um, it's a beautiful city. It's on the border with Poland or near the border with Poland. And is really the sort of the furthest away from Donbass, furthest away from the fighting. It's a place that a lot of people fled to at the beginning of the war to find you know, sanctuary and safety there. But people that didn't want to leave Ukraine felt more comfortable for whatever reason staying in the country. Um, but Lviv became a kind of focal point for a lot of internally displaced people. So it's a good starting point for us. Um, a lot of the organizations that we're involved with are based there at the moment. Um, and the idea is to have two things. One is this disability hub, which say essentially is a warehouse because one of the problems as well is sourcing the right equipment. You can't obviously buy it in Ukraine now. So with our partners in Ukraine, they do everything from like measure the wheelchairs, get everything assessed for us exactly the right order. We get it uh, procured either in Germany or in the UK, we have a, a group of volunteers that are shipping stuff for us. We get it into Lviv, into the warehouse, and from there, we distribute it out to wherever it's needed. So essentially what we're gonna be able to fund for a year is this disability hub, which I can't tell you how much it directly impacts people's lives. You know, we have amazing letters of thanks from families where, because we got them exactly the right equipment, it has liberated them from the issues that they were struggling with. And I want to mention one more thing about that. You yeah. also brokered um, uh, an arrangement with the manufacturers to basically give us all of these things at cost. So we're getting, right, or, or yeah. close to cost, right? So we're getting these wheelchairs, for example, that are as like, they're exactly what people need. They're not, they're not going to be, you know, struggling to use these yeah. devices, um, but they're a fraction of the cost that they would normally be. And then volunteers are literally driving those pieces of hardware across the Polish border and mm -hmm. to Lviv and it, it, getting yeah. it there, you know, all we're paying for at that point is gas. And exactly. And we have an amazing network of, of people. They're actually, they're ex-military, many of them um, that have come forward and want to be involved because they're great at logistics, great at planning the road, the road side of things. We have begged, borrowed and stealed and probably blackmailed a few um, companies that make this equipment. And so we, you know, it's things like maybe we get the chair and then we ask for the pressure cushions for free. And you know, we, we're kind of constantly making deals so that it's way below what you would be able to buy anywhere else um, and some of it. But at the same time, what's important is we're not just getting handouts. We're not getting stuff that's secondhand that's of no use. We are making sure it's exactly what the beneficiary, the partner needs to make sure that all their needs are, you know, freed up to, to give them the freedom, their independence. Um, so it's, it's brilliant. And I'm really proud of, of the, the, the amount of efforts we're doing. Um, you know, we have shipped, um, I can't, I'm, I'm laughing slightly to myself. We, we were talking about how we would um, explain the amount of equipment that we've already sent out there. And we were joking that everything seems to be done, you know, the size of a bus or the size of a whale. And we actually found uh, a site that it, it you can put in weights and it will tell you on different things. So we did actually work out the amount of otters worth of weight that we sent out there. So maybe I should share that with you as well. And you can know yeah, the various good. strange that's animals. A good stat. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. So now I'm, I'm laughing because whenever I talk to, to Tash, my colleague, we're always like, well, we just sent out about 200 otters worth of uh, wheelchairs or... <laughs> 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 so yeah, um, why do we get stuck in these 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 dated uh measures of of uh the units of measurement we, we yeah. Be, yeah well I, I promised to do that through the whole gish hunt is to send various, various uh, obscure animals as reference for the amount of volume and weight of um, okay, and we also have this so we have the basically this uh amazon distribution center yes, uh exactly. that we're up, and then uh and that and we'll be funding that for an entire year and we then, are the Bezos of good. And that will cost uh, $50,000 US. Yeah, exactly. And then the second initiative that we are undertaking to fund in Lviv is? It's a shelter. Um, it's actually going to be two shelters. One is for uh, women. It's a sad fact, but in a conflict, uh, rates of domestic violence tend to go up. Um, other issues uh, in households can be, become more problematic. 
Um, and also women who have uh, unfortunately lost their partners in the conflict, um, maybe in areas that have been occupied by the Russians and who have been victims of, of sexual violence. There's many reasons why women have to find safe shelter. And so we are going to be working uh, with a group called uh, Women's March, which again is a long-standing civil rights organization in Ukraine. And we're going to be working with them to set up a safe shelter in Lviv for women. At the same time, we're partnering as well with Insight, which is a connected organization who works with the LGBTQ plus community. And we will again be supporting them to set up a shelter for similar reasons. Again, there's a lot of people in that community uh, that have been persecuted, that are under very, very high risk of Russian control, um, which could be anything from physical harm to losing adopted children. So again, we'll be setting up that shelter where also children can stay. I should say that on both shelters, um, you know, they are um, going to be roughly, you know, for the budget we're looking at and hoping to raise about 50,000. Both shelters will have 125 people in uh, approximately, um, and they'll be funding that for a year. So that's a huge um, amount of, of life changing support that we will be giving to some of the marginalized in communities in Ukraine that have been largely ignored by the international community. Um, it seems like an incredible amount that we can do with a, a rel such a small amount of money in the scheme of things. So what we're asking you Gishers to do is uh, there's a link, you can follow the link, you can, you can start your team's fundraising page. What is important to note in order to get the points on this item, your you the requisite that what we're asking you to do is to get other people to donate to your team's campaign we're not asking you to empty your own pockets for this we're asking you to go out into the world and source support for these projects and if we can get to a hundred thousand dollars we can have this we can have this incredible impact it's really three different projects two shelters and this distribution center all of which are already set to go the the um the 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 wheelchair and other um, disability hardware support um, network is already underway. It's already functioning. This is just to um, to support it in an ongoing fashion and give it give it a sustained impact in Ukraine. Um, Giles, you are going to be giving us an update when you get to Ukraine. Yes. On uh, well, when people are watching this, it'll be tomorrow. I believe. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> uh, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm not quite sure when people are watching this, but it's where we we are going. You are uh, arriving Sunday night in Ukraine, yep. and um, take care. Be careful. Yeah, I, I'm always, you know, always. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm. I'm want to say as well one one small thing. I know a lot of people, and I, you know, very happy that over the years, a lot of people in the Gish community have become friends, and and we you know, we chat on social media. I know a lot of people feel very overwhelmed by what's happening in the world and Ukraine. Um, and it, it's easy to just kind of go, what difference can we make? How can we change things? And again, I'll go back to what I was saying right at the beginning of this. We have changed lives for the long term. We, every year, don't just do these kind of short term fixes. We do things that enable people to live completely different lives for the whole of their life and also their children's lives and probably their grandchildren's lives. And that for me is what's so incredible is yes, it's hard when you see everything's going on, but it's also incredibly positive when we look at what we've done every year. And we're gonna be do that the same. We're gonna be hundreds of lives in Ukraine changed those children's lives and for generations. And we have to focus on the things we can do, not worry about the things we can't control. And each day get up, think, what is it that I can do? What positive change can I make? And don't be overwhelmed by all those things you have no control over. And this is a moment for us actually to seize control, to make a difference and to change lives. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Love you, bye. Bye.